Welcome back for the last chapter of CCT 250, or uh, chapter 15, Defensive Technologies. So here we're going to talk about our key learning objective, which is identifying um, security controls and defensive technologies. Our key concepts are going to be talking about um, IDS and IPS systems, firewalls, other common detection methods, and security issues. Why is this so critical? One of the biggest challenges you have to face as a professional in the security world is keeping your environment secure the environment that you're responsible for. Now, this is simple in concept, but the speed and complexity of threat emergence means that that's going to throw some serious uh, monkey wrenches into the gears. More people will be interacting with using your network, accessing the resources that are contained within. Uh, your network infrastructure will massively increase because post-COVID, um, so many businesses have gone full remote or at least largely remote, and in order to access resources securely, we need things like VPNs. So again, we've thrown a lot of things into the mix that are going to make your uh, security operations significantly more interesting. Our key terms for this chapter are going to be application proxying, defense in depth, demilitarized zone, firewall, honey net, honey pot, uh, HIDS, host-based intrusion detection, implicit deny, uh, IDS, which is just intrusion detection, IPS, which is intention, uh, intrusion prevention, Network-based intrusion detection, or NIDS. So HIDS and NIDS are largely the same thing, but they focus on either an individual on the network or the entire network at large. Packet filtering, security controls, and stateful inspection. So defense in depth is one of my favorite things to talk about with students getting into security because it's pretty easy to understand. It's very much like the idea of, uh, you know, playing a game of hot potato at a birthday party where you uh, pass the package around and when it stops on someone, they pull off a layer of paper and eventually you get to the prize in the middle. This in a more, I would say, adversarial context would be that if an attacker is trying to breach your network, you want to make sure that there's always another barrier, if at all possible. The more layers you have does not necessarily mean the greater level of security, especially if those layers are kind of junky. Um, but the more layers you have in general, the better your system is if those layers are uh, worthwhile, if they are well implemented, well designed, well thought out. So defense in depth aims to minimize the attack surface of any protected resource. We're trying to limit the amount of potential access that is possible without the approved level of credentials. And we also need to have some kind of verification in there to make sure um, that not only the person has the correct credentials, but they are who they say they are. So multi-factor authentication is also important. We want to be able to use a combination of strategies rather than relying on a single one. Because as I think we've gathered over the previous 14 chapters, single, single service solutions do not work. Um, they can be broken fairly easily. We want to make sure that a multi-layered defense strategy is established in order to leverage our ability to implement technical controls, physical controls, and logical controls. So the term intrusion just means unauthorized user access of a system. So that can happen in any number of ways. Um, an IDS is essentially a ramped up packet sniffer, so it's able to identify whether or not traffic comes from an approved source or a non-approved source. Misuse is internal. Uh, traditionally, it can be either malicious or benign. It's just the improper use of resources within an organization. So intrusion is external, misuse is internal. Detection of these things is the technique of uh, in uncovering successful or attempted misuse or intrusion. IDSs rely on two main mechanisms to function. Signature recognition, also misuse detection. Uh, it helps to find activities that could be indicative of problem events. Signature analysis, which is where we identify known attacks based on code snippets. Um, most IDSs are based on signature analysis. So let me give you an example of the rundown of what happens here. A host creates a network packet. At this point, we know nothing about it other than the packet exists. In step two, the sensor is going to read the packet off the network through sniffing. Um, the IDS and the sensor are going to match the packet with a known signature of misuse, and then we generate an alert. The command console is sent the alert, receives it and displays it, and then the security admin uh, or owner of the system 
is able to respond. So once the response happens, this is around step five or so, um, then we can log the alert for future analysis in step six. We can do this locally or a central location, and we have completed the incident alert process. By doing this um, repeatedly and establishing a proper baseline and things like that, we're able to respond to threats much more intelligently based on signatures. Now, granted, we could have a much more aggressive system where anything that triggers a signature could be blocked, uh, but that would make normal traffic difficult as well. Now, anomaly detection is where we try and find deviations from the norm. That's the baseline I was just talking about. This model is generated by the system owner based on the knowledge of what is acceptable and known behavior on the network. In modern systems, the IDS is configured to observe traffic in a training mode, which it learns and observes uh, on the network during the different periods. So you want to make sure that you have observation that occurs during peak periods, low periods, etc. You want to give it a, an idea of several different indices of what would be considered normal. So here's an example of an IDS response matrix. If we have a positive, positive can either be true or false. A true positive is where an alert was generated because an actual intrusion attempt occurred. That's double good, we want that. A false positive, which is, is negative in a way, but it can be dealt with a little bit differently. It was a perceived but non-threatening event. We want to be careful with dismissing false positives because on occasion these can be used in order to desensitize the system so that it does not pick up on a true positive later on. A proper negative is that an alert was not generated because no suspicious activity was detected and none occurred. So no news is good. A false negative, on the other hand, is very bad where we have an alert that was not generated because no suspicious activity was detected, but did occur. So this is a miss here. Um, in signal detection theory, an analogy that I like to give people is, think about your cell phone. If you have a phone in your pocket and it's set to vibrate, let's say you're being considerate of people around you. Um, how many of you can think of a time where you have felt your phone vibrate in your pocket, you pulled it out and take a look at it, and it hadn't done anything? So that sensation is a false positive. We, uh, we generate the alert psychologically, but there was no information there. If we had no alert generated because no activity was there, that's normative, that's, that's the standard level of activity. If we had a true positive, that's where we you know, feel the buzz and we pick it up. It's like, oh, somebody did text. And then what we don't want is we don't notice the buzz and the trigger did occur. So, there are different ways to think about it, but this, this just falls into signal detection theory and uh, application of this relative to the IDS. So as I said a little bit earlier, we have both host and network-based intrusion detection systems. For a network system, um, this is going to detect suspicious activity across the network. So some examples of that might be repeated probes of services on your machines. Now, that's not saying that it's like, oh, I'm trying to connect via, you know, RPC to be able to do some kind of remote desktop protocol to be able to fix something, uh, you know, RPC endpoint management or something similar, especially if you are um, trying to do remote tech support for somebody who's on a VPN or something like that. Um, but repeated probes of what services the system offers, uh, enumeration, that would be something that would trigger. Connections from unusual locations. Um, this can be geo-locked. This can be uh, from a preset list of approved IP ranges. This can be done um, to where if it's uh, trying to access a certain resource, it has a different list than a, a public interface, obviously. Repeated logons from remote hosts, especially if they are um, failing due to password validation or similar. That may be uh, somebody trying to breach containment. And then arbitrary data in log files, which can indicate an attempt at creating a DOS or a crashed service. On the other side, slightly more uh, user focused, of course, is going to be the host based intrusion detection. This is going to look at specific items on a computer. So modifications to system software, configs, uh, gaps in system accounting, slow system performance, crashes, reboots, 
uh, log issues such as short logs, incomplete logs, inconsistent logs, missing logs. Um, like I said, the, the gap in timestamps earlier is, is kind of its own thing, but there are some related items with this. Um, logs with bad ownership sets or incorrect permissions. So people have been trying to, to futz about with the permissions and gain access. Other types of abnormal system performance will often fall under HIDs as well. So processes you don't recognize, unusual graphic displays, unusual text, um, you know, certain types of uh, malware will have pop-up generators or things like that can try and get you to um, click and authorize into particular issues. So uh, log file monitoring is involved. This is where software will analyze log files for any of the events we just talked about, as well as failed or successful logons, potential violations of root policy, file access, permission changes, privilege use, um, system setting, alterations, account creation, account deletion, uh, anything that hasn't been approved or vetted. And that's the thing is that whenever these activities are undertaken, um, change management dictates that we should have a log of this is approved. This, there's a kind of a chain that we can follow saying this person um, initiated this request. It was reviewed. It was approved. It was executed. It was logged. The ticket was closed. So ticketing systems help us to see, oh, this is something anomalous, but we have an explanation. So we can see false positives versus um, true positives very easily. So it's important to make sure that we understand that the human element is still necessary, no matter how good our uh, IDS and, and uh, IPS systems become. There's also a part that deals with file integrity checking, looking at um, whether or not particular system files have been changed or uh, database alterations. This is one of the oldest and simplest types of IDS works, which is basically just having a baseline for what the file was supposed to be versus what it is now. Um, I believe Tripwire functions in this way, and that's one of the older um, IDS systems that I'm aware of. So if we're comparing HIDs versus NIDs, we need to know where it's suited, how do we manage it, and what are the particular advantages of each. For a NIDs, we're looking at a large environment where critical assets on the network need extra observation. We're looking at the network as a whole because maybe we have different objects that have to work together rather than focusing specifically on just one device. In a HIDs system, we're looking at where system level assets need monitoring more so than uh, network based assets. Management concerns are not too bad for a NIDs um, if the environment is sufficiently large. You know, there's kind of a cost benefit analysis of how much we have to work with this versus how much uh, benefit we're going to be able to reap at the end of it. If we're talking about um, a smaller environment, installing a NIDs may be overkill and it's going to incur a lot of overhead because it's going to be over analyzing a much smaller set of network traffic. It's also much harder to create an appropriate baseline because you don't see a cross index of numbers of systems that are working side by side to figure out what is normal. A HIDS uh, management deals with specific adjustments and considerations on a system level, so there's a little bit more involvement with the administration of a HIDS. But once you've got a profile down to where, okay, you know, I've got 40 computers that are supposed to work roughly the same way, I have sat and I have tooled this one to the point where I'm, I'm confident of what it's going to do, I can then deploy that HIDS configuration across multiple units. At that point, if we have, you know, a couple dozen, a couple hundred computers, we may want to consider moving it to scaling to a so again, a lot of this comes down to good practices, good principles of what are the policies I'm incurring. And then we look at the broad strokes of how many devices are going to be uh, under the auspices of this particular policy that I'm dictating. The advantage for a NIMS is that it's great for monitoring sensitive network segments. A HIDS is great for monitoring specific systems. Again, network detection versus host detection. There's very clear differences here. So IDSs have a number of different components that help them to function. Pattern recognition, um, traffic analysis, so we're looking for anything that's unusual. Um, heuristic behavior analysis can sometimes be incorporated just as it would be for antivirus. Uh, integrity checks, user and system activity logging, traffic monitoring analysis, um, and then event monitoring and analysis as well. Now, for some people, this may sound pretty boring, but um, again, this is not the only application of network analysis in cybersecurity, being able to do um, more 
high level analysis to be able to build your group policy and be able to make those dictates are very different than you're just pouring through logs trying to figure out where a breach occurred. In some cases that can be very tedious. So just bear in mind, working with an IDS or working with different types of uh, security administration devices, uh, appliances they're often called, um, is only one aspect of what we have in terms of applying uh, cybersecurity rules to an organization. So let's look at a NIDS set of components. And we're gonna look at HIDS as well, but we'll do, we'll do NIDS first because we want that broad spectrum. So we can see here that we have a sensor that has to be present to be able to observe traffic over the network. And then we have a monitoring console. So as that is uh, approved, we go through the same steps we talked about earlier, create the packet, sniff the packet, match the packet with known signatures, uh, generate an alert if necessary, send that to the monitoring console, and then we can respond and log. Pretty simple. Um, you know, the command console represents where the system administrator is going to manage and monitor the system, and then we'll do our day-to-day -day tasks of monitoring, tuning, and configuring. Um, this can be accessed from anywhere or from only a specific system, depending on your security levels. The network sensor is a discrete application that runs on a designated device or system as needed. Again, very similar to a sniffer in that it runs with a uh, promiscuous set network card. Um, it has the ability to monitor traffic on specific segments because of the same restrictions that are placed on sniffers. Um, so these may have different set permissions or things of that nature. So with a HIDS, we don't have the sensor. We just have uh, the network sensor. We have sensors that are placed on the hosts individually. So again, this is uh, kind of the difference between having a uh, like a general manager at a store and then like a regional manager that goes above them, um, you know, kind of the hierarchy. If we take out the sensor, we're going to have direct reporting of each host to the monitoring console as opposed to the median sensor of the network that then responds back. So the command console is going to be pretty much the same. Um, but the monitoring agent is going to be specific to each individual host and will monitor changes in permissions, system settings, file mods, and any other specific uh, suspicious activity. Setting goals. This is an important one because we have to kind of, we have to know our limitations, right? So we have to find a middle ground between accountability and capability. What can the system do um, versus how do we respond once we get the information from the system? So let's talk about capability. When an IDS recognizes suspicious activity, it has to respond somehow. It goes ahead and receives, analyzes, and compares data, and then provides some form of response. Now, we normally say that an alert would be the common one, but that's not the only option. Um, responses could be any number of potential actions depending on your goal. There can be automatic responses, or there can be alert-based responses that pass on to an administrator. If we get into um, automatic responses, however, we're not doing detection, we're now doing prevention. So that might raise it to an IPS, not an IDS. Um, in most cases, logging gives us a lot of benefits for our business because we have a larger data set to analyze historical patterns and figure out expenditures. Logs are also extremely useful in determining the effectiveness of various security measures. Um, now we need to be aware, an IDS only detects activity after it's occurred, so that means that after the issue has passed through security measures, now we need to figure out why it happened and how it happened. Accountability is an alternate aspect of that coin to where we have um, having responses in place beforehand. If we don't have a response plan, if we don't have accountability, the system loses its effectiveness. Um, as part of our policy, we have to define a process in which the source of and cause of an attack are identified and investigated. We need to be aware of um, who is responsible internally for, for setting those results up, who is responsible for consolidating those results, and who is responsible for providing an incident report at the end of the day if the attack is severe enough. This process is necessary because of the potential need to pursue legal action, not to mention finding the source and cause of the attack to refine your defenses for the future. So IDS, of course, like any other piece of equipment, has some limitations. We need to know what the IDS is capable of, so read the manual, um, have somebody who knows what they're doing in your organization be able to um, make a, a, a simplified explanation if necessary. But if you're working with an IDS directly, most likely you already have that expertise. 
And IDS only supplements existing security technologies. There's never going to be a magic bullet. Um, for those of you who don't know what that phrase means, magic bullet means that, you know, one shot does everything. You know, that's not, that's not how this goes. You have to have a number of different things working together, hence defense in depth at the beginning of this chapter, um, in order to apply the principles of security effectively. IDS only detects and reports what you tell it to. So if there's an attack that we're unaware of, or if there is a behavior that should be marked as abnormal but isn't, that is on us. We have to understand and update our network. We have to be able to do analysis. We have to be able to do benchmarking. We have to be able to look at a network and say, this is normal, this is not. And that, that human uh, assessment is really what makes us necessary as cybersecurity specialists. If we were able to pre-program a machine to do everything we need and then not have to worry about it, kind of a set it and forget it, Ronco style solution, then we wouldn't have a job. If the hardware supporting the IDS fails, the IDS may become ineffective or worthless. So know how to maintain that as well. IDS deals with detection, but not how to deal with it, hence the IPS. And an IDS may generate data that is considered to be extensive. So that means that there has to be somebody to be able to, you know, kind of parse through it and figure out what has happened. And is this information uh, considered beneficial or is it extraneous? Now, with a prevention system, this is the next step. This is where we actually respond to different levels of attack um, by using different forms of access control. Now, again, just like with an IDS, we have host-based and network-based. A host-based system would deal with specific systems, and a, a network-based system would deal with the network as a whole or specific segments of it. So an IPS may uh, regulate traffic, may stop suspicious traffic, block access, um, block out an account that has erratic behavior, and it may do so by implementing a firewall. A firewall is going to control the flow of network traffic. It's a set of rules that allows us to determine whether or not a particular packet meets the criteria for entry. We can separate networks and organizations into different zones of trust, and we can go ahead and define where the perimeter of the network is going to exist. What is the barrier between everything inside and everything outside? If there is another layer inside that needs to be further protected, we can incorporate firewalls. Um, again, you know, we can have layer upon layer. Now, it's not necessarily the wisest idea to have, you know, several layers of firewalls without having the logic behind it correctly worked out. If you have, you know, firewalls uh, basically double checking each other, you may run into a situation where you have them arguing with each other whether or not the behavior of the first firewall is causing the anomalous behavior that's being detected by the second. So we always have to make sure that we can segment these things appropriately. So let's look at some different modes that firewalls can operate in. Packet filtering, that's, that's you know, first gen firewall. This is where we can only do the most basic of traffic analysis. Stateful inspection or SPI, um, this is where the attributes of each connection are noted and stored by the firewall. We're able to perform a measure of intelligent analysis there. Uh, and here we're able to look at application proxy. This is where we perform translation of the address as well as additional access control checking and logging and then connects to the server on behalf of the client. So an application proxy level firewall would definitely be much more complex, much more expensive, and much more. Labor intensive to administrate correctly than, say, just a standard packet filter. Firewall can have some limitations, just like any other piece of hardware. We talked about the IDS a little bit ago. Um, viruses. You know, this is not an inherent ability of a firewall to be able to block viruses. Some firewalls do, but I would say that you would want to make sure that you have host based protection for antivirus on each device, as well as something that can be uh, monitored in a more network level operation. Again, these tools are all working in concert with one another. You should never rely on just the one. Misuse, of course. Um, employees automatically have a higher level of access to the system than an outsider. So sometimes in trying to carry out their business uh, in a more effective manner to their own mind, they may disregard company rules, bringing in software from home or downloading things from the internet. Software has no ability to judge intent. So firewalls are not very effective in this way. This is again why we have to make sure that there are multiple areas in which a potential threat could be deterred. Secondary connections, 
um, secondary access. If a firewall is put in place, but employees can connect to mobile hotspots on their smartphones, thus bypassing the corporate network, employees are now open to hole in the firewall. So this is where we can have rogue AP problems, things like that. Social engineering, of course. Um, suppose a network administrator gets a call from someone who says he works for the ISP that serves our network. Caller wants to know about our firewalls. Um, they need to be able to set configurations for X, Y, or Z. If the administrator gives out this information without checking the caller's identity and confirms that this person needs to know what they're talking about, we're giving the game away. Um, hopefully that wouldn't happen quite so frequently. or implement, it can have gaps. So we always want to make sure that we test. Um, you know, we want things to be very evident to us. Sometimes you'll call it, you know, like the body roll test or the Antilly test or whatever you like. Oh, excuse me, whatever you like. The idea is <clears throat> that you have some way of, of trying to run uh, your network normally outside of production. It has to be in a testing environment first so that that way you can see, hey, there's a problem with the design when you'd be able to to edit this here. So let's talk about implementation. Here we can see that we have a single packet filtering device. We have traffic coming from the net, firewall is there, and then the LAN is inside. So any traffic that does not meet the criteria for entry is automatically denied. Simple enough, right? If we have a multi-homed device, we can have two LANs with inside, inside the same firewall, and now we have to be able to determine how packets are forwarded between these interfaces. So this is where we have kind of like a security version of routing, figuring out where something is supposed to go. So if something is supposed to go to LAN A, it gets filtered through the appropriate port. If we have something for LAN B, similarly, we pass it through there. If we have something that is not designated for an appropriate network under our control, it is rejected. A screened host, is an extension of this idea, and this is where we combine the features of a proxy server with packet filtering. So you can have a router responsible for controlling network information being rejected or accepted before it gets to the firewall. So in some cases you may be, um, again, just trying to compartmentalize who's responsible for what, what's gonna be the primary mode of access. A demilitarized zone, or DMZ, this is essentially a gap between two firewalls um, that is set up to host publicly available services. The likelihood that somebody's going to be able to get through both firewalls before an alert triggers is not high. Uh, so it just helps to make sure that somebody is only accessing public resources if that is what they are allowed to do. If they're trying to access private resources, then obviously we need to verify their credentials and make sure that the rules are in place to appropriately allow that access. The firewall policy for a network is the blueprint that determines how the firewall is installed, configured, and managed. It's the setup listings to say, this is what it's going to do, this is how we verify that it's doing what it should be doing, and this is what happens if it fails. It's a subset of the overall security policy for the system. Again, you know, your organizational security document, your security platform, all of those things should be living documents just like a uh, business continuity plan or disaster recovery plan but you should be able to access them individually so that we can make sure that we're paying attention to the appropriate rules and regulations for that subset. We have two common approaches here, implicit allowance and implicit denial. Implicit just means that it's, it's part of the fabric of what we do. Explicit means we have to actually state something. So implicitly, we're going to allow everything and only deny explicitly things that we do not want. So this is going to be a blacklist. So it's going to say everything's allowed until you mess up, in which case we will then deny those particular threats. On the other hand, a whitelist is where we deny everything and then only allow things that have been approved, vetted, etc. So the blacklist is much more functional. The whitelist is much more prescriptive. You have to find a way to strike a balance between the two. Obviously, the more quote unquote secure is going to be the whitelist, but it's a ton more management. If you have a system that's going to be, you know, public facing or something similar, and there are just specific threats you want to block, then a blacklist might work a little bit better for you. Network connectivity policy. This is just an example. So this is not exhaustive by any stretch, but um, network scanning prohibited except for approved personnel. That makes sense. 
only certain types of network communication allowed. I think that's a little bit vague. They might want to put some bullets there about what, what types they're talking about. Users may access the web via port 80 as required, may access email on port 25. Works. Users may not access NNTP. That's a handy little blocker there, may um, prevent some, some side, side, uh, sideways attacks, if you will. Antivirus software and updates must be installed and running. Only network administrators may install new hardware. No unauthorized connections to the internet. That seems reasonable. Now, that's an internal statement. But what if we have contracted workers? If we have people that are contractors for our organization, their access probably needs to be slightly more limited because their role and involvement in the company is also limited. The problem too is uh, con contracted workers are unfortunately a common source of state actors uh, being placed by a uh, foreign uh, opponent of some kind. Um, not necessarily foreign in terms of like outside of the country, but outside of the company, um, like a, a rival competitor. That would be somebody who might uh, use a contractor to try and gain access to things that they might not otherwise. So a contractor worker statement might change some of the things we saw on the previous slide and now say, um, any resource that's listed as unauthorized is automatically excluded from this person's network access. They're not permitted to scan the network in any capacity because they are outside of the listing of authorized personnel as described in the previous listing and may not use FTP in any capacity unless granted permission in writing. Um, so, you know, network upload or download of file transfers, that would be a pretty strong limitation. The administrator statement for a firewall. Um, you know, it's pretty obvious that the firewall administrator is a clearly defined job role that requires rules and regulations. It's not uncommon for organizations to have a policy. Others may not, but it occasionally needs to be reviewed and make sure that we don't need to actually declare some of these things explicitly. It's great to have in a large organization because these terms need to be clearly set so that, you know, the rules are applied evenly and fairly. So in this case, it needs to be the administrator has to be trained on the firewall that's in use, be aware of all applications and services that are authorized. They report to a CIO or CISO, and they have to have some kind of procedure to be able to reach the firewall admin um, in the event of a security incident. So they become an on-call style employee um, so that you know when they go home at the end of the day, they can't really leave their job on the table. Honey nets and honey pots. Um, a honey pot is a computer that's configured to attract attackers to it, such as a decoy, especially people who are running script kitty attacks, uh, to where they have automated kits that are trying to perform, you know, port enumeration or things like that. It's placed in a location so that if an attacker gets around the firewall, the honey pot draws attention away from more sensitive assets. Now, as a hacker, um, Depending on how the honeypot is configured, you can detect it fairly quickly, but also now, you know, honeypots become more advanced. So it's the, it's the ever escalating arms race between attackers uh, and defenders. A honey net is a group of vulnerable systems um, grouped together. So you have a network of honeypots made into a honey net. Now there are of course gonna be some concerns about legality. Um, if we put a honeypot out there where someone can attack it and then they do, can you prosecute for the crime? Because, um, you know, some people think that this is an issue of entrapment. Some people think that this is, oh, you're trying to lure people in to do these things. It's like, yeah, but why are you running the tool in the first place? So um, the, the precedent that often gets cited is when um, the vice department of a police precinct puts somebody out on the street pretending to be a sex worker. Um, obviously they can't solicit from people openly, but they can be present. And if somebody comes and solicits them, they can then be arrested by law enforcement for soliciting uh, lascivious acts, you know, things like that. So it's important to be aware that there are defenses to this, but of course, you know, the legal profession thrives on trying to find ways to um, bend and twist around. The rule of controls. Um, obviously controls are, are what drive the system. So the role that they play is very crucial. Um, but part of our layered approach or defense in depth that we talked about comes in three categories, administrative, technical, and physical. Um, the TAP model on occasion. 
By combining our layers, we of course gain the advantage of multiple mechanisms so that if one fails, there's always another in place um, within reason. Common controls are going to be administrative. So the implicit deny we talked about before. Um, basically, the, the benefit here is that we default to a state where no access is given if there's no rule automatically explicitly listed. Uh, least privilege is where we only give individuals the level of access appropriate for their job role or function. We don't give them something they don't need. Seems smart. Separation of duties. This is going to dictate that a user is never in a situation where they can complete a critical or sensitive task alone. If one individual, for example, could evaluate, purchase, deploy, and perform tasks on their own with no check or control, that individual has too much power, which should be distributed across multiple people. Uh, job rotation. This is where people periodically move between job roles to keep them from staying too long in a sensitive role, which can help to prevent abuse of power and to detect fraudulent behavior. Mandatory vacations. Uh, this is where employees will go on um, some kind of sabbatical for multiple days in order to give the company time to just make sure everything's good. Usually it's only the like a single week or something similar. Um, these are usually going to be paid because they are enforced by the company. The organization's auditors will go ahead and check for any discrepancies. And then at the end of the work week, the, the report will be presented and either things will be good or they will not be good. Um, privilege management, this is using authentication and authorization mechanisms to provide centralized or decentralized administration of user and group access control. Uh, we also need an auditing com, uh, component to be able to track privilege use and escalation. So it's just making sure that nobody's trying to uh, perform lateral or, or vertical escalation. Tech controls, very straightforward. Access control software, malware solutions, so you know, antivirus, anti-malware. Um, passwords, security tokens, and biometrics. Lastly, uh, in the common listings, we have the physical controls. So alternative power sources like backup generators or UPS, flood management would be drains or ducting, um, so we can drain water from an area quickly. Fences, which are just simple physical structures designed to prevent access. They can be a deterrent or an imposing barrier. You know, you can have um, fences that are just standard privacy fences or, you know, hip height, um, you know, uh, chain link fence. You could have uh, barbed wire. You could have, um, you know, armed guards walking around, you know, placing the human element on site in order to provide not only um, an element of intelligence, but the ability to react to unanticipated situations. Uh, locks, just to provide a uh, sense of minor security by prevention of easy access to sensitive areas. Locks can be circumvented, of course, but the complexity of the lock can be relative to the situation uh, as a whole. Biometrics regulate physical access, bio meaning life, metrics meaning measurement. Location and design. Um, this is where a building's construction and layout is going to provide a measure of protection by ensuring that facilities are not located where they may be prone to given threats. So, um, you know, physical design may be dealing with fire and flood, whereas location items may be to place sensitive assets or facilities where they're out of public view. A tool that incorporates uh, a lot of different controls simultaneously is an SIEM, Security Information and Event Management System. It's a collection of software and devices that help professionals manage their environments. We get logs, we get traffic, we get um, process analysis, we get real-time manipulation as well as historical traffic. We can get trend analysis from those. Um, and we also get alerts for suspect activity. We can also have tools that help us to manage our security more effectively, such as um, you know, automatic kicking of someone based on unusual traffic or um, temporary throttling of speeds, um, blocking certain services. SIEMs are very, very powerful, and as such, they're traditionally pretty expensive. So if we need some more guidance on these materials, which I'm sure if you plan on going into this, you will, um, look at the STIG listings, Security Technical Implementation Guide. Um, so there's a number of different ones. If you go to stigviewer.com, if you go to NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, they have a checklist repository uh, at nbd.nist.gov slash ncp slash repository. If you want to go to the Information Assurance Support Environment, or IASE, 
uh, you can go to iasc.disa.mil slash stigs slash pages slash index.aspx. So there's a number of things online that can be available to you. Um, hopefully that will uh, clarify some of the ideas that you may see about security policies. And that's it. We went over intrusion prevention and detection, both host-based and network-based. We looked at firewalls, various detection methods that may be related, and some common security issues. And I think the most important part is we looked at the human element and how human thought and human reaction has to be at the center of this. The only reason we incorporate machines is because they're fast and they're accurate. It does not mean that computers are intelligent in the way that human beings can be intelligent. Human beings have intuition. They have non-deterministic thought. Um, you know, as, as dry as some of these latter chapters have been talking about the GRC aspects, um, it's important to understand that those rules help to make sure that we're working to make sure that we are creating an environment in which we can still conduct business, but we are providing a much more secure outlet. I certainly appreciate your time and attention. It has been a very interesting semester, as I'm sure you are uh, also aware. I've had a great time. I certainly appreciate it. I'm having, uh, having, having the opportunity to work with you. So if you have any questions or concerns, you know, come up on the um, please. Uh, you're, you're free to sit in on the, uh, the lectures. You're free to uh, send me an email, come on by the office, you know, send me a, a quick message, me an email or Blackboard or YouTube or whatever else. Um, I look forward to hearing from you. Give us good feedback. What drives me to be better at this? Really, that's all I ever want to do. I love what I do, and, and being better is a big drive for me. So, uh, last time for this class, thank you again for your time and attention. I appreciate you so much, and I'll see you at the final.